Here in the trailer of Ars, we do tend to drive rather long distances from time to time. For example, driving down the street to the nearest supermarket that still has toilet paper. For example, fleeing the zombie apocalypse, whatever. Some of us drive long distances routinely. So here's how to choose the best vehicle for that. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where I strain. New car buyers save thousands off their brand new cars. Yes. Hit me up on the website for that. Before we get cracking properly, how are you going with the zombie apocalypse? I meant to ask the other day because I'd have to say I'm quite disappointed overall. I've seen all the movies, seen Mila Jovovich take on the zombie hordes and this has been most disappointing indeed. The reality is far different than the fantasy as with all other things I'd have to suggest. I was at the supermarket this morning and aside from, you know, no pasta and no rice and no eggs and no meat and no toilet paper and of course, no hand sanitizer. The only skirmishes I had were with the living. I almost feel gypped. Anyway, I hope your experience with the apocalypse has been somewhat more satisfying than mine. Here's a question from Jack. I am a paramedic who has recently been sent from the big smoke out to the Dubbo region. <laughs> yes, quick shout out to all of my loyal viewers at West out in the Dubbo region and beyond, you bogan gators and you broken hilliers. You know who you are, you Kobarians. Jack goes on. I'm driving back to Sydney on my days off, currently in a Mazda 3, and being almost blown off the friggin' road by road trains, or having to ford water crossings with the heavy rain out here. Not ideal. I look at what all the locals out here are driving, and it ranges from your small SUVs to large land cruisers, and I cannot decide. I will be driving to many different ambulance stations out here, which could be as far as Lightning Ridge. Quick shout out to all my loyal viewers out in Lightning Ridge, you Lightning Ridgerians. You know who you are. Good luck with the opals there. As well as my six hour trip back to Sydney every two weeks. I will not be towing anything and would like to do the occasional off-road camping trips, etc. I would love your help in finding the right car for the right price, as well as decent dealer condition, such as warranty and capped price servicing, etc. I'm looking at options like a Suzu D-Max Toyota RAV4 or Subaru XV. Lightning Ridge, play that funky banjo, white boy. I understand the problem you've got, Jack, I really do. I've got a lot of time for you paramedics too, so thank you sincerely if you are watching this report and you are in that line of emergency services work, particularly on the medical side. This sincere gratitude also applies to you, of course, if you are in the trauma department, a nurse, a doctor, an orderly, whatever. Thank you most sincerely for all of the good work that you do every friggin' day on the job, meeting all of those people on the worst days of their lives. It's a paradox, right? Your line of work, you don't get to do your best work until some poor bastard or bastardette has the worst day ever. An above average degree of psychological resilience not optional in your line of work, I'm sure. And it's actually one of the unsung reasons why the road toll is lower today than ever before, particularly per capita, because you lot keep more people going who would previously just have croaked. So thank you, sincerely, on behalf of society. I mean, even though nobody elected me spokesperson for everyone. Maybe later. So. For starters here, I'd be forgetting any vehicle with a space saver spare tyre or which cannot easily be retrofitted with one because being limited to 80 k's an hour out there in West Bumfuck after fitting the space saver is going to be literally, depending on where, a pain in the ass. See what I did there? So that rules out the Mazda 3, I think, and its siblings plus the Subaru XV and so forth. The RAV4. It's a joke, mate. In practice, the waiting list for the hybrid variants in particular is horrendous, and Toyota should be shot, frankly, for its epic mismanagement of that 
customer interaction there, the waiting lists. I mean, come on. As for being blown off the road, okay, by the aerodynamic wake vortices from large trucks, uh, that's kind of bullshit, mate, respectfully. That Mazda 3 of yours weighs 1.4 tonnes, and I'd suggest it's not going anywhere in that airstream. You feel the wake, certainly, but you're really not getting blown off the road. It's just unpleasant, and you don't feel it in the city because the velocity's not that high. So, water on the road, that's always tricky. See... Mazda 3 has a ground clearance of 150 millimetres, if memory serves. That's about six inches in America. If you upgrade to a CX-5, okay, which has a space saver, so don't do that, but I'm just keeping it all in the family here for the comparison purpose, you'll get 200 millimetres of ground clearance, which is a much more satisfying eight inches. Yes, America. Down there. So... This is going to be a, a slight advantage if sections of the road are awash, but if the water is flowing or if it is in any way deep, just stay out of it, dude, in either vehicle. I mean, the last thing you need is someone in your line of work coming out to rescue you. That would be an epic own goal. I'm sure they'd never let you live it down. Learn to play the banjo in that case or just squeal because you're going to be there for quite some time. Yes. The problem with upgrading to vehicles like 4x4 utes and land cruisers is pretty simple. These vehicles are excellent for off-road capability and heavy towing, meaning they do severe off-road comparatively easily. And they'll also tow a 3-tonne or even a 3.5-tonne trailer with a bit of compromise. And when I say off-road, okay... I don't just mean driving down some friggin' dirt road. I mean soft sand, slippery, deep mud, gnarly ascents and descents, which you can barely walk up and down, respectively, an ankle-breaking rop, rop, <laughs> rop hopping and rock hopping as well, stuff like that. A lot of people think, you know, off-road is every time they leave the bitumen and it actually isn't. A dirt road is still a road. A normal car can drive down most dirt roads. So this hardcore all-terrain capability intrinsically in those kinds of vehicles, they make those kinds of blue singlet off-road vehicles drive like shit on made roads, okay? Don't forget that. And before you dickheads in the comments just start in with your friggin' bleating, and just for disambiguation, okay, I did not just say that everyone who comments is a dickhead. No siree. There are plenty of rational people who use respect and logic and reason to add value in the comments. And to those of you, I say, I love you in an entirely non-fag way, I mean, even if you're a chick, and come to think of it, especially then. But there are quite a few dickheads down there, I think you'd agree, and... By way of, you know, talking them up, I could say, at least if you are one of those dickheads, you are entertaining. But before, if you are that dickhead, before you bleat, perhaps like this, My fucking ranger is the best fucking car I've ever owned, mate. Rides like a Lincoln in town car on the fucking highway. I'd retort, do piss right off, because it doesn't. Compared with a car, that... Frickin' Ranger rides and handles like a bucket of shit, both on the highway and around town. Fundamentally, this is just engineering compromise. You can't have both exemplary performance around town and exemplary off-road performance and heavy towing and big load out the back, and it can't be just brilliant at all of that stuff, no matter what the glossy marketing brochure says. So you've got to choose what's important and what's not and what's a priority and what's not and where you're going to compromise and where you're not. And here's my recommendation on how to do that. If you're way out there at Lightning Ridge and you need to drive back to Sydney, which is a lazy jaunt of just 750 k's, which is just under 500 miles, America, it's all going to be on made roads. Remote roads, in part, certainly, and long distances between urban centres, but made roads, mostly bitumen. The vast majority of the driving jack here is going to do is on made roads, plus maybe a tiny amount of flood water fording, but hey, we are on the driest continent on Earth, so not that much on balance, plus the 
firm possibility of a definite maybe of a tiny amount of off-road this and that to a potential idyllic campsite at some undetermined date in the future. So on balance, how about in this situation, you buy a vehicle that's really good at the vast majority of the driving you're actually gonna do as a dead certainty and which can do everything else that you want but perhaps with a little bit of compromise, okay? There's an idea. Something which can, with a certain amount of compromise, do the kinds of driving you might do for just a tiny proportion of the vehicle's operational assignment with your ass proudly pressing down on the dead cow, yes. If you're a paramedic, when you think about it, this is kind of like triage, or at least packing the bag that you're gonna use when you get winched out of a helicopter to patch some badly injured dude up. And what do you put in that bag, okay? I'd suggest all the stuff that you are likely to need as a priority in a dead set hurry to keep a badly injured person going so that you can actually get them to hospital alive. You know, trauma shears, tourniquet, airway management, whatever, chest tubes, a couple of them probably, big fat syringes full of succimethonium and thiopentone, <laughs> all the good stuff basically. And you don't put in any of the stuff you can probably do without, like penicillin. Some bacteria, not going to kill some dude quickly, I'd suggest. So not so important in the domain of urgency. And choosing a vehicle is just like that. Which means that the smart move here is to get a vehicle that does a good job on made roads, which may be, of course, a bit crap in places out there because, you know, large distances and not that many people paying tax per kilometre of road in this joint. Don't take this the wrong way, okay? People always propose this kind of thing to me, like, we might go off-road camping. And sometimes they even go out and they buy the pimp's Cadillac of off-road campers, only to go camping, I don't know, twice or maybe never. Or they go camping to places you could drive in mum's friggin' Corolla. So they end up driving this big, heavy, cumbersome shitbox out on the highway all the time at 110 k's an hour, and it's compromised to the proverbial, and definitely this is not ideal, okay? The towing fraternity is like this as well, eh? They just don't think straight. You've got people who tow some caravan 200 k's up the coast and back once or twice a year, which is up to 800 k's a year of towing, if you're lucky, and like 15,000 k's of normal driving when you're not towing, all right? So why not buy a vehicle that does a really, really good job of that 15,000 k's of normal driving and sort of does an okay job at only just the twice per year annum, whatever, 800 k's of towing? If you have to suck up some compromise, do it on the towing, which is only a tiny amount of the overall driving that you ask the vehicle to do as opposed to, you know, buying a vehicle that's outstanding at the towing but drives badly, let's say, for the other 15,000 Ks. There's a hell of a lot of people doing that. A lot of people go with option B, the compromise, every day, driving to the shops and back for the zombie apocalypse, whatever, and I don't know why they prefer this. So basically, if you're actually gonna do the full-on off-roading and not just occasionally driving on some dirt road or a fire trail, then I'd suggest look at a vehicle like a Pajero Sport because it's based on the Triton Ute, so definitely tough enough, but they've made it a little bit more civilized thanks to that coil-sprung rear end and the eight-speed auto. And it's really good value too. So it's more capable off-road than most people will ever demand of a vehicle. And if you're just going to camp you know, occasionally at the end of some fairly easy trail or a dirt road in some sort of mediocre condition, then buy something like a Kia Sportage or a Hyundai Tucson. These have a full-size spare and a lockable four-wheel drive system in case it rains and gets a bit slippery underfoot overnight or something. Decent dynamics and a seven-year unlimited kilometre warranty in the case of the Kia or five years unlimited for the Hyundai, so there's that. Good customer support from those companies too. 
I'd get the 2 litre diesel if I was going to pick one of them, which will be remarkably efficient for the large proportion of highway driving that Jack is going to do in the course of his work and returning home to the big smoke, as well as it's going to go more than adequately for overtaking and climbing over the Blue Mountains, whatever. There's a lot of mid-range power in a modern diesel, so there's that. The main message here to anyone selecting a vehicle to do anything with is optimise the choice for the bulk of the driving that you're going to do and ensure you've got capability, even if it's a bit compromised, for the other things that you'd like that vehicle to do, but only occasionally. If there's going to be a compromise, compromise on the activity you do the least of.